Cause you're listening to Jams and Tea on see the show on your TV so we talk about things musically. Cause you're listening to Jams and Tea. You're listening to Jams and Tea. Welcome everybody to a Record Club episode of the Jams and Tea podcast where this week we're going to be discussing Saoirse's recommended record which is um, the Indie Tronica uh, group broadcasts uh, third studio record Tender Buttons. Um, so uh, Broadcast is a band that uh, is quite close to my heart and I'm presuming quite reasonably a band that Sersha has a reasonable interest in as well, considering that she's recommended the record. So <laughs> Sersha, why don't you talk a little bit about, um, well, first of all, who are broadcast? What is this album and why are we discussing it today? Right. So Tender Buttons is an important record for me because um, right in the early days of the chat that sort of birthed this podcast existing, um, I caught this recommendation of uh, Tyler, I think. Um, and yeah, <laughs> since uh, Suck It Out and uh, Sort It Out, sorry. Um, and I, there wasn't really other records that I listened to that, that sounded the way this sounds with its, its sounds electronic and dreamy and, and weird but also very like granular and um kind of uh textural it feels like um it was recorded on acoustic instruments even though they it's obviously electric ones but it has that sound of like um you you could feel the resonances coming out of the particular instrument they were recorded on um and that text is really like led where my interest in music went over the next couple of years sort of leading up to now um yeah yeah just reflecting uh, when i was listening to this record because i listened to this record um three times in the last 24 hours for whatever mm -hmm. reason I, I mean obviously i like the record but for some reason it's like one of those occasionally what will happen when i'm preparing for this podcast is there'll be an album that just kind of suckers me in and i end up kind of like addicted to it um mm -hmm even though I've had this record in my life for a decent amount of time now. But what I was thinking about uh, earlier was, uh, and reflecting on the fact that you recommended this record, and it's, it surprised me a little bit that you were as into this record as you were. But then I thought about it some more, and I thought about the fact that I was reflected on the album that you put out this year, and the way that that record, uh, a lot of different points, integrated sort of organic guitar indie tropes with sort of, distorted buzzing sort of harsh electronic yeah. textures and the way in which in the way in which you kind of had a we <laughs> explored <laughs> sort of how those kind of sounds uh can fit or not fit together or what the contrast is, is between those sounds and obviously uh i hadn't it hadn't occurred to me when we were kind of when that album came out and when we were reviewing it um that whether intentionally or not um the music of broadcast is a clear kind of point of influence um, or at least a clear kind of antecedent to the sort of stuff that you yeah. were doing on that record anyway. Um, yeah, I, it's, it's sort of more like um, that was like the beginning of my sort of journey into the kind of music that sort of formed that influence, Yeah, I guess. And so just to get step back a little bit to give a little more context, um, Broadcast are a, well, were a Birmingham-based Indietronica act, rose to prominence in the uh, early 2000s, off the back of a string, uh, a, a series of three specifically, um, quite understated, but original and I think beguiling records. Um, 2000s, The Noise Made by People, 2003's Ha Ha Sound, and this record, which was the last studio album that they made. Um, and a kind of important piece of contextual information that doesn't necessarily uh, affect the production of this record, but I think does affect how I reflect on it is the fact that um, Trish Keenan tragically passed away in 2011, um, suddenly due to illness. Um, and, le and so despite the fact that Broadcast was still ostensibly a group, even though they hadn't made an album in several years, they were still working on projects. They uh, ended up working on the score to the Peter Strickland film, Barbarian Sound Studio, um, yes. which came out um, posthumously. Um, after Trish's death but anyway that 
sort of horrible, tragic and sudden thing, um, I think casts a sort of definitive arc over these three records, knowing that there will be no more music to come from this band and set, sits tender buttons in an interesting position. Um, obviously, I know that I'm considerably more into broadcast than the three of you and, and I don't necessarily expect any of you to have really delved into their other stuff. So I'm going to kind of give a perspective that I think is informed by the other stuff they've done. But Tender Buttons, I think, is still you don't necessarily need to have that prior listening to their uh, previous records to really appreciate what makes it good. And I think it's really, in many ways, kind of of the three records they made, in many ways, it's the quintessential one, even if it's not necessarily the friendliest one. Um, they And their, their arc is kind of interesting. They started off as this kind of gentle, vaguely psychedelic dream pop band um, the, with their first album in the vein of like the clientele, for instance, where the electronic tones and flourishes were flowing through their music, but they weren't necessarily uh, at the core of it always. But then across the course of their three studio albums, rather than getting more polished and sort of conventionally focused as most bands tend to do, the textures of broadcast became more abrasive um, while their songs still remained gentle and unassuming. And, and it created this weird dynamics, sense of dynamics in their music um, where the uh, polarity of the different sounds and their songs are, are getting more extreme, basically. The dream pop, so to speak, fades into the background and the electronic textures grow more prominent, uh, harsh and fuzzed out. They also have a kind of uh, kitschy sound to them as well. This is, they're a, this is a lo-fi band through and through, even though I think Tender Buttons especially is, is a really well-produced record. Uh, it is well-produced in the sense that it is a really good sounding lo-fi record where that lo-fi aesthetic is a purposeful textual decision um and so what what results is an interesting album to review it's the least friendly uh broadcast album i think but it's also the one that feels like the fullest realization of their distinct sound the one in which broadcast sound least similar to any other band um and i find them here to be at their most beguiling um, but also at their most adventurous as well. The experience, I think, of listening to Tender Buttons, um, I would love to hear from the three of you on how you found it, especially coming at it as with less of a personal involvement with the band than me, for instance. It is a strange experience, I think. I, I, the, the band that broadcast get compared to the most, um, I think it's kind of a rote comparison and a, a pretty uh, uh, two-dimensional one, but it's stereo lab, basically, in terms of this kind of, these kind of electronic textures and and gently dreamy uh, orchestrations and also like the, the very kind of uh, ethereal female vocal. All those are kind of like key features that unify both these bands. But Stereo Lab are this swirling kind of jazzy uh, jam band, basically. And Broadcaster yeah. are absolutely not that. Broadcaster are not. And, and I also... I also think another point to be made about that stereo lab comparison uh, in, is that in terms of the lyricism, these are two bands that are also going for very different things. Stereo lab is much more political with their lyrics and uh, uh, broadcast is a little more on the esoteric interpretable side. A absolutely. Yeah. There is um, uh, one, and there's one, I think track on this record where, at least on some level, Trish Keenan appears to get political. And maybe you could draw that comparison there. But there's also an interesting story on how the lyrics in that track were written, but I think, which we'll get into eventually. But um, I think for the most part, I agree. Uh, Trish Keenan's lyrical style is much more abstract. And, and, and again, she uses her, her voice more as a kind of textural asset to the music. Yeah, um, and that's absolutely part of like my attraction to the band um, for me. I like um, on a song like, uh, let's go to like Black Cat, for example, the second mm -hmm. track. Yeah. Um, when it hits the chorus and you have this sort of, uh, I think like a synth bass in the background doing, uh, burr, burr, duh, burr, duh, and it's doing that in a loop uh, and she's singing, um, bad luck always happening to someone and repeats that and then repeats uh, just Black Cat over and over again. Like uh, for me, I, I get what that means. That's fine. But at the same time, the real enjoyment is not really to pay attention to that so much, but to get caught in the sort of 
abstract uh, sort of not so didactic nature of the lyricism so you can get caught in the nuances and the gaps between meaning um, whilst that really fuzzy music is doing the work of building um, an ambience the fact that the lyrics aren't like trying to be particularly coherent means that it's just this like swirl of ideas yeah you kind of get lost in um i i do I, I i completely agree and i also think that it's also worth saying that it, this isn't to do trisha's lyricism a disservice although your mileage may vary but i think the way that she goes about writing and and performing on this record is very kind of complementary to a lot of the arrangements and the what trish is doing as a singer as a writer as a vocalist um slots in nicely to what the band do around her so i think at this point it's worth um giving a bit of context on the title of the record so the title of the record tender buttons is a, a deliberate reference to a book by gertrude stein which is the same title which is apparently i haven't read it but apparently a book that was notable for using language in a really unconventional way, um, specifically using language in terms of not meaning, but more just the phonetic qualities of words. Um, and, and, and as a kind of literary texture, um, so a kind of an abstract book apparently. And, and so I, obviously you can see a link between that sort of literary approach and, and what um, Trish sort of tries to do on this record um, and I think a key track that encapsulates what Trish tries to do uh, and how affecting it can be is the song America's Boy, which is uh, a quintessential broadcast track. I would say that this record is, is loaded with tracks that are quintessentially broadcast in the sense that they everything that I think of when I think of the band, all the elements of their sound are in a lot of these songs. Um, but basically, this is a song where you have these cascading walls of distorted melody um, pushing against Trisha's voice again another real key characteristic of the sound um, and actually I have some insights from an interview with Trish about the lyricism of this record um, and and the interesting uh, story behind this is that the lyrics were generated by her reactions to a tabloid cryptic crossword um, the clues were the crossword was topically about the war in Iraq and uh, and Trish recounts an experience of being frustrated at not being able to decipher the clues. And so she started kind of reacting against them, making up her own answers, mimicking the language of the clues, trying to see how that language could be used um, to, I guess, suggest certain ideas or, or create feeling. A again, it's all very kind of vague and ephemeral and stuff, but I think that that's a really interesting detail because she has this kind of stream of consciousness sort of style in the song where she is in her own words um uh asking questions back of the cryptic questions taking offense to them deliberately misreading them um and, and there are these kind of snapshots of american imperialism um and and all these kinds of images in the song that are all kind of swirling and some of them are quite striking and harsh and others are kind of ethereal and beautiful. And that I think is a nice little counterpoint or not counterpoint, but a nice little compliment to the, the music itself, which is so often about this dynamic between the harsh and the soft um, and, and the organic guitar sounds and the really buzzing and kind of almost primitive electronics. It's kind of a bit. And also another so note on the song Black Cat as well, which I think is another kind of key track as well. Um, I think there's ob obvious allusions to Alice in Wonderland in this song with the whole refrain of curiouser and curiouser um, and, and the references to the black cat uh, obviously being an allusion um, to that story. Uh, and so in, in some ways, this is also kind of a bit of a stretch, but in some ways the experience of listening to this record for me is kind of like a through the looking glass thing where you're kind of going from this world, going for, into this world where these uh, different sounds that you're used to hearing, like the traditional kind of dream pop, indie pop sounds, and these electronic harsh textures and stuff that are normally kind of not associated with each other, are kind of contorted together in this weird exaggeration of the real world. Um, yeah. I don't know. That's really, I know that's really kind of like in the weeds a bit but it's this feeling that i get uh listening to this record is is this weird sense of, of everything sort of being exaggerated and and combined in really uh 
in really strange ways. Yeah, especially with the sort of sw swirling dreamlike texture. It has that, uh, I can see that vibe to it. Uh, yeah, but I, I think there's a really good uh, point mentioned there. I think, I think when this record is at its harshest in terms of the sound play is when it works best. Like uh, the aforementioned uh, America's Boy, I think it's called. Mm -hmm. uh, that that opening like is this. It's really stuck in my head how that song starts off. And how a lot of these songs uh, incorporate this much harsher noise sound into these more melodic parts. And I think when the record is doing that, it, it's at its very best and most memorable because I, it, in, the, in those moments, it's really forming a unique personality, which I can't really get out of a whole lot else. And that's that's definitely what I appreciated uh, most about the experience of that record and how that how that can almost come as like a jump scare to you upon initial listening. It can almost be terrifying just how how loud this record can get at like mm -hmm. moderate volume, which yeah. is and, and that's also not a detraction against the production, because I think for that to work, it has to sound loud but not overblown and i think this record accomplishes that quite well for the most part yeah I, I think again it kind of comes back to dynamics so there are parts of this record that are really really harsh i think the progression of early in the record of like the first five or six tracks is really good encapsulation because you have these i think the even number of tracks in that succession are quite harsh and, and blown out and and all of that sort of stuff. But then they're interspersed with tracks that definitely have some sort of harsher textures in them, but are, are more uh, sort of leaning towards the indie rock or the guitar based side of things like the title track, for instance. But I, I love the title track though, because it's kind of like the, it's kind of like an encapsulation of everything the broadcast does. It starts with this loping guitar melody that's very kind of sparse and, and hollow um, but then you get these anxious kind of acoustic strums laying over top of it. And then the lo-fi keyboards come in and they're, they just layer over top of everything. And it's just this kind of amalgamation of sound that uh, is just really uh, pleasing and, and unique and, and interesting. Um, if the record I think uh, has a shortcoming, it may be that the, the band work within a very kind of limited sound palette and, and the gimmick is is reasonably they get the gimmick across i think reasonably quickly and then kind of do various kind of exercises in the songs exploring that kind of dynamic range um but I, what it doesn't necessarily bother me that the record doesn't isn't sort of consistently re reinventing itself because i think that it's a, it's a brisk enough listening experience and i really enjoy the different ways in which this kind of like combination of textures uh sounds on different songs like for instance i and also the way in which it's combined with really uh really good hooks at certain points as well like one of my favorite tracks here is corporeal which is this um buzzing indie gentle indie rock number and it has this really these really strange lyrics i can't even begin to pass about trish seeming to feel like she has no autonomy or is separated from her body in some way or or is or is wanting to be formless it's really i can't really get into the lyrics it's all kind of very esoteric and strange but the music complements this sense that she this emotional sense that she's getting at in this song of feeling kind of like lost and overwhelmed by just almost devolving into complete noise by the end of the song from this unassuming opening and then i think arc of a journey does that uh, and and ups it to the nth degree as well because that's an almost entirely uh almost like music concrete track that just happens to have a, a melody hanging over the top of it a keyboard melody hanging over the top of it it's like sound collage and, and strange and uh, but also playful um and, and and it's the most i think adventurous and and off the offbeat track that broadcast ever made but i absolutely love the way that it comes together i i, I find it to be an absolute feast for the ears especially towards the end where the the vocal melody 
and the main kind of synthesizer or keyboard melody kind of both just fall away and you're left just swirling in this complete soup of these uh, scraping text, noisy textures with these muddy bass hits on top of them. Um, that experience when the record gets to those sorts of points um, from such unassuming, gentle, stately indie rock beginnings, I, I find quite exhilarating to listen to. Yeah, um, <clears throat> that's kind of an interesting point of uh, disagreement, I would say, is because when this record is sort of firing on all cylinders with the muddy bass hits and the bizarre kind of electronic fuckery going on here, <laughs> um, that's when I find it it's at its most compelling. Um, I kind of agree with August's perspective on that end. Um, and I, I find the sort of gentler indie rock stuff to be a, admittedly a little middling. Um, I, w I wouldn't say any of it's outright bad. And I, I think uh, Keenan's lyricism is always sort of obtuse, I guess I would say enough to be sort of enrapturing in that way and I think her voice complements that sort of uh, atmosphere perfectly uh, but when I when I listen to it I feel like almost on a song by song basis it varies from wow this is really fascinating and I'm really into this to oh, all right another pretty pretty good mm -hmm. acoustic indie rock cut that's pretty good and yeah I don't know I've I, f I find the uh, the pacing of the record kind of ends up undercutting itself every now and then with just how sort of much I engage with the disparate parts of it. Mm. I actually, even though I like the record uh, a lot more than I suspect I like it a lot more than you, Morgan, I don't entirely disagree. I do think what ultimately saves this record um, from lapsing into those kinds of... Uh, less captivating sections is the fact that that sort of those sorts of indie rock textures are less they're more kind of like a part of the song than the whole song there's one song on this record that i think doesn't have any notable uh clashing electronic textures which is the song tears in the typing pool which is not certainly not one of my favorite songs on the record it is i like the way it's gently melancholic i like the way that it has a kind of distorted organ drone on top of it that i think compliments or like counters the relatively straightforward sound of it nicely but for the most part um I, this record kind of gets away with those excursions because they're so interwoven into the other sounds of the record it's it, it and i guess there's a certain extent to which that combination risks sounding cacophonous at points or just ill-conceived but i never find myself thinking that that that's how it's coming across uh, I, it, it's always really i don't know it always just kind of works for the most part but but there are moments on this record like for instance there are two quite short interlude tracks that i don't really think add anything to the album and i'm not sure why they're there um but really those are that's a minor complaint considering that they don't take up much of the record's runtime but uh, they do you know, take me out of the consistent vibe a little bit i think um yeah especially because I they often come between two songs that i think would go together much better if they weren't separated by this interlude but anyway yeah i find i find myself kind of stuck on those just because they do sort of stagger the pacing of an album that i already find to be a little bit difficult pacing wise and so that sort of ends up as a sort of snowball effect with how I feel about the rest of the album mm -hmm. and that it kind of, you know, I mean, it's maybe like two minutes of 40 that sort of I can point to as larger symptoms of a problem that I have with the whole record. And it sort of, those two minutes end up having a big effect on how I feel about the whole thing because I can use them as sort of like focus points of problems that are around the rest of the record yeah 
uh, if, if I had to build a little off this this point of, of pacing, which I think I'm I'm mostly in Morgan's camp about, I I think that the pacing is also not aided by the record feeling a little one trick at points. Like okay, we do this uh, loud, more cacophonous stuff blended with the more indie dream pop stuff. And I feel past like a certain point, maybe even the first five tracks is where this record peaks. And I feel after that, the songs for me just start to blend together a little more and more. Even when I do like what an individual song is doing, I tend not to really distinguish it too much from what another individual song was doing. And it it becomes a little soupy for me in that in that back part, which I can understand uh, enjoying. But for me, it, when the record is so focused on this more like abstract, uh, obtuse sound, I would like it that the individual songs maybe hit me a little harder and are maybe a little more memorable easier to come back to is like oh yeah i'm gonna listen to this for this hook or this moment yeah and i feel a bit of that gets lost on me past uh, yeah, i can i can co-sign that completely uh the back half of it especially i feel is not necessarily any worse or better than the front half it just has the disservice of being at the end of an album that sort of ends up feeling samey well, okay. You say, but you say that, that like some of my favorite individual like cuts are towards the back. Uh, so, like the last two, You and Me in Time, and I found the end are two of my favorite tracks. I, 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 I was going to come to the defense of those. I've got a, um, a few things to say um, as well. Uh, I, I definitely think that there are some moments towards the middle of the record where it, it loses. I think it starts with that first interlude, bit 35, where it starts to lose the, the real pace, I think, that it had on the first six tracks. Um, it does recover, recover it a little bit with Arc of a Journey, which I think is in the right place on the record as this really noisy, uh, almost senseless combination of sounds that I happen to love. But then you do get a couple of tracks that I think are a little bit too droney and repetitive for their own good. I think Michael like Grammar in particular stands out as a track that yeah, I find a bit grating, uh, especially yeah, the, I find the, 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 the vocal that. <laughs> yeah, that's no, let's, yeah. let's not. <laughs> but but do that's... That said, I actually think that track, um, aside, hook aside, that track has actually got some of the strongest lyricism on the whole album as well. Um, it's a really great song lyrically about um, the feeling of teenage angst and confusion that I think, and, and lostness that I think is also gotten at in a song like Black Cat and throughout the rest of this record. Um, or just that yeah, general um, feeling of, of, of angst and confusion that I think manifests in this song in the form of this kind of high school melodrama. Yeah, and with that song, um, the rest of the record as well, but especially that song, it actually really reminded me of what I was so attracted to in um, MGMT's Little Dark Age as an album, um, in terms of the textures they're drawing from and how they build a sonic palette. Um, and that middle stretch in the record, even though they're weaker songs, is like sort of full of that for me. Yeah, and I... I, I will co-sign, but I'll also, um, like Sersha, come to the defense specifically of the last three tracks of this album, which are three of my favorites. Um, Goodbye Girls, for one, is a, a really beautiful track that has one of my favorite Trish vocal melodies, but is also plenty of that harshness. That song, I think, is a song where the band aren't too focused on colliding and shifting sounds and, 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 and stuff. They just find a particular combination of tones and they stick to it for a, a really great distorted three minute pop song that I absolutely love. And then the last two tracks I think are really interesting. Um, and, and this is kind of where my experience with the record starts to get a little bit more tinged with the knowledge of it being uh, the last broadcast album and the knowledge of Trisha's death as well. Um, you and Me in Time is kind of like an, a warped nightmare lullaby. Um, it has this really discordant sound to it. But lyrically, Trish is not playing into that weirdness or discomfort at all. Um, she's singing like she's genuinely trying to comfort someone to sleep um, against this really uh, discordant tone, keyboard tone. And the result is a song that feels like 
post-apocalyptic. It feels like some kind of remnant of a happier time that is caked in something dark that's kind of happened in the interim. Um, and and it, 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 I don't know, I find it quite poignant um, in light of, of Trisha's death, um, especially with the lyrical sentiment on this song, uh, really kind of gets me, even though it's a really short song. Uh, and I think it's it's it doesn't need to be any longer than it does in this sense because these last two tracks are, are very kind of minimal. They don't have a lot happening in them, so they don't need to be longer than they are, uh, and they don't outstay their welcome as a result of that. But they also don't feel slight either. Uh, particularly, want to shout out the closing track. I found the end, which is just an instrumental. Um, it is this repeating descending melody. It's heavily reverbed and it's faint. Um, but it, it just, it, I, it, for some reason, it strikes some emotional nerve with me, especially with the combined with that title and the knowledge that it's the last kind of broadcast song proper. Um, and, and, and knowing that Trish's death was kind of this thing that would end up coloring their discography in a certain way forever. Uh, what this track actually reminds me of is the, the final stretch of Boards of Canada's Geo Gaddy. Um, where the beats are kind of get a little bit more stripped away and you get this kind of these really ethereal and dark and hopeless sounds and it feels like you're falling through blackness um, and I think this this little closing piece is just two minutes long but I think captures that with one descending melody perfectly um, if this whole album with the Alice in Wonderland references and all that and and all these references to kind of like lost confused childhood and and all of these things that um trish makes vague allusions to if this is tr um the broadcast stepping through the looking glass then by the end it seems like trish is forever lost in wonderland and the knowledge that she would never make another broadcast album proper feels like a kind of sad twisted and ironic confirmation of that I, I don't know. There's just something about the way this record ends on such a wistful but also desolate note that really got me on those last few listens. It, it's this very, the t emotional tone of this record is very difficult to pin down. Um, and I, I love it all the more for that. It doesn't feel two dimensional at all. And um, as soon as it's finished, I find myself now wanting to just put it back on again and, and trace the different pathways and grooves and just feelings that it goes through as an album. It's, it's a really, I, I don't know. I've, I've really come to like this album in spite of its flaws quite a lot. Yeah. And I think that speaks to something that we've been talking about, about the record and the, yeah, it tends to borrow from the same sort of palette of, of sort of sounds a lot. But then again, as soon as you sort of try to pin down an emotional palette, it seems to be exploring other areas in the next song. Mm -hmm. um, and I I think, well, that's just really impressive by itself. Um, but yeah, you're totally right about the way this album finishes. It, it feels like a really um, open-ended note of like tonal ambiguity for a record that is constantly wrong-stepping you in terms of like emotional substance and like textural emotion um, to end on that like open-ended sort of vague descending melody um, it, it, it really is um, it, it, depending on the listen for me it can either be incredibly comforting and and, uh, and sometimes it's incredibly disquieting and it'll depend on the mood I'm in mm. um, yeah it's just weird it's weird like it's just this one descending melody for two minutes and nothing else and it's one of my favorite things yeah I know yeah same thing. I, don't, I don't really know why but anyway that's basically it Brought, yeah. and this is a really interesting album to review I think because it's kind of hard to describe why it makes you feel the way it does whether that's a positive feeling or a negative feeling it is just this but ultimately at the end of the day that's where I end up having a lot of um, respect and admiration and love for broadcast because they made this kind of music so completely within their own lane um, that it, it, I can't get the specific effect that this band and specifically this record, which I think is their best record, just to be clear, I can't get that feeling um, really anywhere else and, and that, that combination of sounds and that tone really anywhere else. So I applaud it for not only for being a record that I find so texturally wonderful to listen to but also just for being so 
completely unique, I think. Yeah. Okay, well, we'll do as we as we traditionally do then. Um, yeah. Favorite tracks and ratings. Um, August, why don't you go first? Okay, well, uh, favorite tracks, I guess I'd say uh, probably Black Cat. Um, huh, I found the F and America's Boy. Uh, least favorite for me would probably be uh, Michael, Michael a grammar. Is that it? Uh, yeah. And I, I guess I'd give it like a five and a half. Okay, Morgan. Uh, my three favorites are uh, I found the F, America's Boy, and Black Cat. Uh, least favorite is also Michael A. Grammer. Uh, stealing August's brain, I guess. Uh, <laughs> and my rating is similarly 6 out of 10. Um, my favorite tracks are Black Cat, I Found the End, um, and yeah, let's say You and Me in Time, just for fun. And, and I feel the least towards bit 35 probably when i get the record an eight out of ten yeah my three favorite tracks are um corporeal um sad i was the only one that talked about that but understandable corporeal arc of a journey and uh i found the end uh, least favorite track i mean i feel about exactly the same about both of those two interludes um so yeah that would be them and i'm gonna give this record an 8.5 out of 10 Oh, fabulous. Um, so that's an average of uh, a flat seven, um, which is the same as uh, Hesitant Alien, Liana Le Havis, uh, Godspeed You Black Emperor, Godspeed at State's End. Okay. Uh, so that's fun. Cool. Um, all right. Well, let us know at home what you think of Broadcast Tender Buttons. What's your relationship with this record? Uh, how do you feel it fits in the broadcast discography? Is it your favorite broadcast record? If not, which one is? Uh, let us know what you think in the comments below. Follow us on Twitter at James T Pod if you're not already doing so. And check out our other videos. We put out multiple videos a week. We review new releases um, as well as classic or beloved older records like this one. So check it out for more. And uh, over to August to send us out. And as always, folks, rock over London, rock on Chicago, Subaru, confidence in motion. <laughs>